this is Mag Mag Max Hedrum. And what you're about to witness is one of the most sinister sounding intros to a trailer to one of the greatest epics ever produced in the history of t t television. And there's more. Because you are going to see it as well. Yes, it. Yes, it. Yes. Namely, the Max Hedrum Stream story. <sighs> and afterwards, that is directly following, I want to talk to you about something even bigger. Namely, Mag Mag Max Hedrum. So! Sit back, relax, and enjoy my film. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault Podcast. I'm your host, old Jay McCready, and for this episode we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I'm not going to be talking about UFOs or ghosts or cryptids or mysterious Nazi bases or anything like that, or lost gold. It's going to be a broadcast hijack, and it's one from the 80s. That great time that I guess we're fetishing right now, you know, where we used to have VHS uh, rental stores, cassette tapes, vinyls, mullets, uh, Top of the Pops, MTV, uh, Films like Ghostbusters and Lethal Weapon, Die Hard and Indiana Jones. And uh, yeah, it was a fun time. We also had somebody called Max Headroom. That's right, the guy who used to have a little bit of a stutter. Da, 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 Max Headroom. He used to uh, jump in and out of uh, MTV. And uh, I'll talk about him a little bit in a minute, in a little bit more detail. But this incident is about... Um, a broadcast hijack on November 22nd, 1987, on a Sunday night, where two broadcast stations in Chicago, Illinois, were hijacked by video piracy by that very sick character, Max Headroom, but not the real one, someone donning a latex mask and just doing some creepy stuff on this broadcast hijack. Um, but before we go into that incident, let's talk a little bit more about... Max Headroom, there's anybody out there listening to this who doesn't know who he is. So it's created in Britain by a fictional AI, an artificial intelligence, but um, it was made to look like he was an, an AI with um, computer graphics and electronic voice, but it's very clever because it's played by um, an actor called Matt Frewer, and some of you probably know Matt Furrer from a movie called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which came out in the 80s, and he played uh, Big Russ Thompson. And so he had um, uh, latex on his face to make him look like he was a dig digital character. He had um, a typical sort of 80s background, like it was a like a grill sort of floating around. And it was all very sort of, um, I guess the word I'm looking for is very sort of cyberpunk looking. Um, apparently he's a, the story is he was a character from the not so distant future and he started out as a cyberpunk movie called um, Max Headroom 20 Minutes Into The Future which came out in 1985 it um, hit the UK it was a big success uh, Max Headroom became a bit of a TV phenomenon then it hit the US and Max started doing celebrity interviews it was just a bit of fun in the 80s he also hit MTV in a big way where he'd make uh, a lot of appearances on there and he just became iconic. He became just as iconic as everything else in the 80s such as the, the movies and as I mentioned the, the video stores, the VHS, the cassette tape, uh, the Walkman, uh, the cars, the flip up lights, all that sort of stuff. So when you think about the 80s you think about Max and he also turned up on films like Back to the Future 2, made little cameos in that where Marty McFly goes into the cafe and you see him on the screen turn up and he's having a fight with, uh, I think, Michael Jackson on the screen, uh, arguing over who's going to take the order. Um, there was video games that were made for the Commodore 64. There you go, Commodore 64, another iconic um, computer game from, from the 80s. And also um, promoting Coca-Cola with the uh, catchphrase, catch the wave. So there you go. So yeah, Max was a thing. And if you don't know him or you've never seen him before, go and check him out on um, Punchy's name into Google and um, it'll come up. So 
So let's talk about the incident. Um, so back in, so 33 years ago, back on November 22nd, 1987, on a Sunday evening at 9 p.m., there was a TV broadcast of two uh, stations in Chicago, Illinois, and one of them being WGN TV. And they were doing a broad broadcast of the Super Bowl, I think it's with the Chicago Bears, and then there was an interruption with this person in a Max Hedrin mask. It was a latex mask. Um, the broadcasts were very static. There was no um, speaking in this. It was just um, a very creepy static tone with uh, this person in a mask just uh, dancing around, dancing erratically around the screen. And this lasted for 25 seconds. And then when it came off, the anchor man said this. Well, actually, I'll play the clip. Well, if you're wondering what's happened, <laughs> so am I. Actually, the computer that we have running our news from time to time took off and went wild. So what we're going to do is start over from the top of the Bears and tell you once again about the 30-10 to 10 victory they had over Detroit today out at Soldier Field. So there you go. There's a clip of the anchor man, and he's... Looking just as confused as everybody else, probably a little bit embarrassed about it. Um, but this wasn't the only time that evening. Uh, there was a second one at uh, 11 o'clock, and that's, this was on the WTTWS channel, and there's a broadcast of um, Doctor Who, the one with Tom Baker. In fact, that was my favourite Doctor. Um, and it was a episode of Horror of the Fang. And... This one lasted a little bit longer. This lasted for 90 seconds. You had the same character turn up. You had some somebody in a mask, in the Max Hedrin mask. And this time, they were doing the same sort of gesture. You, you had that same very creepy static tone. And I'll be honest with you, when I watched it, even on YouTube, I felt a bit creeped out by it. Even now, because I, I know that this is a, an unsolved case. It just felt a bit creepy. And could you imagine at the time you're watching Doctor Who or you're watching your news broadcast and boom, this comes on. And the person made a reference to um, Max Hedrum's uh, catchphrase with the Coca-Cola, um, catch the wave, but instead he was mocking it, holding a can of Pepsi. He also sang the theme tune to a 1950s animation called Clutch Cargo. The actual theme song and then it ended with um, the character exposing his buttocks on screen and being spanked by a woman with a fly swatter but you don't actually see the woman so this end this lasted for 90 seconds in total in fact what i'll do is i'll just play you a clip of that uh broadcast hijacking and uh, see what you think i think it actually sounds even creepier as a audio tone without actually actually watching it so here you go so that's it so yeah it's it's just creepy and it just turned up out of nowhere and at the time like i said with the anchor man, he was just as thrown off his chair as everybody else. I think generally the, the response with the public afterwards was a lot of people found it funny. Some people were annoyed that they had the interruption. But uh, generally on the whole, the actual um, studio engineers and technicians and the people in charge were actually worried about this broadcast. Um, they were thinking that, you know, the longer it went on, you can imagine for, it's probably the longest 90 seconds for them. They, they, they got a little bit concerned because of the behaviour of this guy that was doing the hijack. Um, they didn't know what he was going to do. Um, it was out of their control and they couldn't uh, knock the signal off. Um, and the art director for WTTW, uh, news, the, the channel, uh, Paul Rizzo, he actually recalled that he got increasingly stressed the weirder the, the content got. And so after the event, and even up till today, 33 years later, no one has come forward. No one's taken responsibility for it. Um, the FCC got involved, and they're the Federal Communication Commission. Um, 
the, a bit like the sort of government FBI for, for communications, and they said that they will do a extensive investigation into the case, which they did, and they rounded up that if they did catch the person responsible for it, that they would get a... Uh, they're looking at doing a year's um, in prison and get a $100,000 fine. So that's what they were looking at. But um, they couldn't find anybody. Uh, there was a few people's names that came up. And one of those people was an American from Indiana. Uh, he's called Eric Fournier. And he was a member of a punk band called the... Well, he was in two punk bands called The Blood Farmers and Skedagore. And he began working on short films which were very similar to the content of this video. Same same sort of MO. Where he played a alternate character called uh, Shay St. John. And the character he was portraying was a supermodel who was in an accident who got disfigured and had to rebuild herself with body parts, with a collection of, well, mannequin parts. And it's creepy. You know, I'm using that word quite a bit on this, but that, that's creepy as well. Check it out on YouTube. But um, yeah, that kind of freaks me out. And I guess you can see the MO there where, where it connects with this. But uh, the FCC can never prove it. And. Um, Fournier, Eric Fournier passed away in 2010. They they could never prove that he did this, and now we could never really get that sort of confession from him because sadly he's passed away. Um, but to this day, his bandmates from from the punk band actually found it funny that you know they thought that he was responsible for it. So I think they kind of like the fact that he was the uh, subject in the, in the rumours with this, so I kind of left a little bit of a legacy there. Um, but with the, like I say, the extensive investigation, the only thing that they could work out is how how this broadcast was achieved without finding anybody, was that um, it was created by sending a more powerful signal to both broadcast towers uh, in Chicago, which would have been a difficult task back in 1987. Um, but the experts believe that the um, people that were responsible for this would have been close to those towers, uh, possibly in the basement of the building, um, and then they would have had like a they would have had to use a, a, a satellite dish, place it in between the two towers, and then ramp up the signal. And you would have had to use quite a lot of power for this. Um, but again, nothing. The place was searched. There was nothing found. Um, and it's something that's more difficult to do now because it's switched from analog to digital, uh, and that was in uh, 2009. So yeah, they they investigated it. They scratched their heads, couldn't work it out. Uh, the only conclusion that they came to is possibly a disgruntled employee. But usually in these cases, if it is, it's usually the fact that someone will come forward to claim it. So then they can say, well, look, it was this did happen. It was me, um, but they didn't which kind of makes it even more stranger and even more of a mystery. But um, this isn't the first time this, this ha has happened. Um, there was another case in 1986 where you had someone called Captain Midnight and they interrupted the HBO broadcast of The Falcon and the Snowman and Captain Midnight's uh, dig at HBO was the fact that they put their prizes up to actually watch this channel. Um, and this was a five minute um, transmission um, but the difference with this case was that um, through the investigation 200 um, enthusiasts uh, came forward and they were eager to actually claim that this was them because they found it amusing this is the first time that they, they had seen it and they said yeah it was us um, but you had 200 people and they couldn't, couldn't work out who it actually was between amongst that that 200 but um someone did come forward eventually it was john r mcdougall uh, he was a former operations engineer for the florida teleport link and he actually claimed that it was him and they proved it and he ended up having his radio license suspended he got put onto probation and he had a five thousand dollar fine so this was kind of like a sort of watershed moment in broadcast um, hijacking. 
Now, whether this is through this incident, all those other two two hundred good people that came, you know, com, you know, were sort of trying to sort of claim the incident, probably looked at that and thought, well, <laughs> they're actually busting you for five five thousand dollars, so we might just stay quiet." So it's probably the reason why no one came forward with the um, Max Headroom incident, possibly. But what is strange for me, just looking at this, and this is my perspective in this, you know, um, Darren Randall, if you're listening, you remember we was talking about Arthur C. Clarke, when he says, well, this is what I think. So <laughs> That's a little shout out to you, mate. This is my part. So I've had a look at this. The reason why I'm here today is I thought it, it's quite a, it's quite a short thing to talk about because this is just a broadcast hijacking at first I didn't know whether I was going to do this episode because I thought is there enough for me to talk about with this but there was this one thing I looked at and I actually had a look at the whole case and when I came to the end of it um, that last segment I spoke, spoke about there is where 200 people came forward with the 1986 incident but no, no one came forward with the Max Hedrin one now that Kind of just interests me a little bit because I think even though um, it, it it was a felony to actually you know hijack a station, of course, and you'll get in trouble for it, um, and people were probably thinking, oh, they might slam me with five thousand dollars. I still think someone might just come forward, even though they didn't do it, just to claim it because it was just so you know sort of phenomenal and sort of iconic. But as it turns out, the actual gov, what the government, obviously the broadcast stations were embarrassed, they didn't know what it was, but I think the government had a little bit of a twitch here with this. And their main concern now is, and this is where I open the door up to, to a little bit of a sort of like conspiracy, is the fact that someone could ha- actually hijack a station and broadcast. And they, they were thinking that if they can do that, could they actually hijack one of our government satellites. Now, at the time in the 80s, there was the tension between the Soviet Union and America. It was the Cold, the Cold War. So, obviously, the government are thinking, now, hang on a second, someone's hijacking um, a station. Could they do that to one of our st- satellites? And then could they get the... Um, could they do this to a spy satellite? And then could they re- reveal government secrets and stuff like that? So I think this is why there was a little bit of a twitch. Um, so although, um, I guess at first glance, you, you know, it's a it's an interruption on a broadcast station. The audience, some of the audience, probably found it funny. Oh, it's Max Headroom. It's someone messing about in a mask. Um, Nine, nine times out of ten, those people were just going to say that was hilarious. The new, news anchor got a little bit in, in, embarrassed by it. But I think the people here who really got a little bit of a concern was the actual government thinking, well, if someone started splashing all our secrets all over the all over the station. So there was a cause of concern in, you know, that's another possibility. Was it the Russians having a little bit of a go here, you know, having a bit of fun with the, uh, the Americans? So... Just a just a theory, just putting that one out there, especially with the Cold War, or was it just someone having a bit of fun? And this is the thing with this with this case. I don't know, um, but up until this day, no one has come forward. Um, it's incredibly creepy. <laughs> it's it's kind of like a bit iconic where it's uh, Max Headroom, and it has happened again in the um, more recently. Uh, Although uh, today's signal intrusions are a little bit more difficult because of the uh, digital world that we live in, people can still still pull it off. Uh, 2007 in New Jersey, there was a, uh, a cartoon called Handy Manny, and this was part of the Disney Channel, I think, and someone jacked uh, the station with uh, a couple of minutes of pull. So you can imagine the shock on their faces with that. So yeah, it, it does still happen. But um, yeah, there you go. That's it. This is this is the uh, um, the Max Headroom hijack incident, which is, remains unsolved to this day. So for it, thirty-three years down the line, we still don't know who it is. But you know, as I said, could it have been the Russians having a little bit of a dig, or was it just someone having a little bit of fun? And I think um, on the whole, I think that's what a lot of people. I think that's the main conclusion. Someone had a little bit of fun on a broadcast station 
And um, the main conclusion from a lot of people on this is maybe there's some things we don't really want to know. It just happened. It's an instant. It's a mystery. Um, it's iconic. So we'll just leave it at that. So that is the that's the conclusion to this. And unless one day we we will find out, but. Uh, that's it. I thought I'd bring this one to the table. I thought it was a little bit different to everything else. Um, probably worth mentioning that these things do happen. And um, now let's just say, I say with everything else, just to blame the aliens. How could I not bring the aliens to the table here? Maybe it was our first um, contact with an alien race, thinking, well, we'll or maybe it wasn't a Mars. Maybe that's what the aliens look like. Maybe they look like uh, Max Headroom. So <laughs> there you go. I'll leave it out there for you guys to uh, uh, think about this one for yourself. But um, yeah, go check it out. Go and have a look at that video as well. It is, is creepy. Don't watch it by yourself. Don't watch it in the dark room by yourself because it kind of is is a creepy video. So there you go. Um, so that's it, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, so let's do a little bit of admin for the show before I wrap it up. So I am a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. So please go and check out all the other shows on there, including my other show, which is bite Size Cinema Podcast. We've got a couple of new episodes that I'll be recording soon. Uh, one is going to be Mad Max Fury Road with um, a guest, Bo Ranzel. And I'll be doing The Evil Dead 2 with um, a fellow podcast host, uh, Mark Ball. So look out for those. And um, you can find uh, the Mystery Vault podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, several other players. If you type in the Mystery Vault podcast onto Google, it'll take you somewhere where you can listen to it. And I've also got a Facebook page. Um, that's where I'm most active, and that's the place to contact me if there's anything that you want me to review, any mysterious stuff that you want me to take a look at. I'd be happy to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's it, guys. So, as always, keep it mysterious, keep it safe, and I'll see you soon. here in this room is a well. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.